Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, and welcome to New Books in Genocide Studies, part of the New Books Network of podcasts. My name is Kelly McFall from Newman University, and I'm a host on the show. And just last night, I opened my New York Times app on my phone, and I discovered an article uh, with a title that asked whether the increasing number of people buying second homes in small towns in Wales and the increasing presence of those owners who spoke English, who out, um, bar, uh, out negotiated the original inhabitants of, of these homes. And so these home, the, 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 the original uh, owners of the home or people who rented in those homes had to leave uh, and just generally transformed those towns. The title asked whether this was in fact a form of cultural genocide. Uh, and it was interestingly timed, given that I was going to talk today uh, with Jeffrey Bachman, who's written a fabulous or edited a fabulous book published in 2019, but now out in paperback um, called Cultural Genocide, Law, Politics and Global Manifestations. It's published by Rutledge. And it's this really interesting set of essays that asks uh, questions about what cultural genocide is and, and, and what drives it and how we should respond. Um, and it, it was in, the, in my mind the whole time when I was reading this New York Times article. And so I'm thrilled to get to talk to Jeff about this today. Jeff is a senior professorial lecturer at the American University in Washington, D.C., uh, and interested in the study of genocide and of human rights more broadly. And so, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it'll be interesting to be on the other side of the mic for this one. <laughs> Yes, and I didn't say, um, Jeff is a, a co-host on the channel. You've heard his voice before, I'm sure. Uh, I love listening to his interviews, and, um, and I'm excited to give him a chance to talk about his work this time. So, so that's a tiny bit about you, Jeff, but, but let's give you a chance to talk a little bit. How did, how did you become an academic? What, what made you interested in these issues of, of human rights and genocide and violence? Thanks again, Kelly. Um, you know, it's interesting to sort of date myself. I was a senior in high school in, in 1994, um, and I was actually taking a um, elective history course uh, that was on contemporary issues. And, um, you know, the Rwandan genocide, of course, uh, had started in April of 1994. And so we did, uh, we did spend some time on, uh, on the Rwandan genocide. And, you know, at the time being 18, um, it, I was a little, uh, maybe naive in terms of understanding how politics work. Um, and I, cause I was, you know, it was hard to imagine why isn't something being done, um, to stop this. And of course, uh, there, you know, a whole episode could be on how, uh, the genocide was being framed at the time. Um, but nonetheless, we knew lots of people were dying and it just, you know, astounded me. I didn't understand why, um, nothing was being done. And that just, you know, a little bit about, um, you know, what led me ultimately to, to genocide studies. Um, but uh, I don't want to get into too long of an explanation. I'll say that my undergraduate studies, uh, I was sort of um, encouraged, I'll put it, to uh, study something that um, my, you know, my dad believed would have a, um, a longer career outcome. And so I studied business and um, I also surfed and, uh, I actually used my business degree to get a job at Ron John surf shop in, uh, at the Jersey shore. And I realized at the time, you know, um, this just wasn't fulfilling to me. And, uh, so then I last minute applied to uh, a master's program in composition and rhetoric. And cause I've always had an interest in how language has been used, um, for persuasion, but also for manipulation. And so I did a, a master's in comp and rhetoric. And then I was teaching writing courses as an adjunct. And I realized I was basically turning my writing courses into writing intensive, like international studies courses. And so that's when I realized, well, maybe I should, uh, if I want to be teaching what I want to be teaching, uh, maybe I should go on for doctoral studies. And um, you know, I applied to the doctoral program at Northeastern University. And it was a uh, interdisciplinary program, which was great. I got to take a course on media coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I was also taking a course at the law school on international human rights law. And then I ultimately did my uh, my dissertation on the Genocide Convention and the evolution of the language for preventive purposes, because there was so much research on the punitive aspect. And I wanted to see, well, how did the language evolve in terms of genocide prevention? 
And uh, yeah, so that's sort of tying together, I hope, uh, you know, how I both became an academic and, um, you know, and genocide studies. And, you know, the last thing I'll note is I, I did spend a year at Amnesty International uh, in 2004. And it was a really interesting time um, to be there. Uh, there were discussions about the Darfur genocide and whether or not to call it genocide. And this was also somewhat illuminating to me, just to, so sort of the discussions that go on about when to use um, certain words to describe things. And it made me you know, think back to you know, the Rwandan genocide when there was like, you know, you know, in the United States, there was that those documents or memos saying, you know, be careful calling it genocide. Um, legal's concerned that we might actually have to do something if we call it that. And um, so it, it fed into this interest in in, in how we use uh, discourse to um, maybe push for certain outcomes that are preferred by uh, by the actors involved. So uh, sorry if that was a, a long answer, but uh, yeah. Um, oh, my, my point of bringing up Amnesty International was simply that, uh, you know, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do the NGO route after gaining that experience because, uh, I, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, as an academic, also, um, we have a lot more freedom. Like, I, I'm not representing Amnesty International um, or some other organization as an academic. Um, we're, you know, we're essentially representing on ourselves, but also our, our universities. And I found the academic freedom part of being able to focus on uh, what I want to be focusing on, when I want to be focusing on it, um, you know, was, was more attractive to me than uh, the NGO route. Okay, so do you still surf? I, I have. It's it's funny. The last time I surfed, even though I'm about three hours from uh, Ocean City, Maryland, the last time I surfed was in La Jolla Beach. It's uh, so for some reason I've surfed in San Diego, but I've never. Well, I'm not never, but it's been probably uh, ten years since I've surfed on the East Coast, which is very strange since I live uh, essentially on the East Coast. Uh, it's something I would really like uh, to do more of. It just never seems like there's enough time. I was going to say, you've just confirmed every undergraduate's perception of academics that they've chosen to sit and read and write books rather than surf. <laughs> right. But I do play pickleball now, though, <laughs> <laughs> which I know is the craze right now. So. It is indeed. And that, so does my wife. And so thus do I. So, <laughs> um, so, so why? The, so, so actually, let me ask what, what, this is not your first work. So what have you done in the past? What books and, and, and things have you concentrated on before? You talked about the Genocide Convention. How, how, what is your path to this book? So um, I, so my, you know, my dissertation, as I mentioned, was on the evolution of, of the, the preventive language. And, um, you know, it's interesting. After I finished that, I actually sort of ran away from genocide studies a little bit. Uh, it had been such a huge part of um, you know, both my academic and my regular life. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, there was so much being revealed about the uh, targeted killing and drone strikes program. And so I, I spent a few years uh, writing about that, um, everything from uh, how the New York Times and Washington Post covered uh, drone strikes, and especially in their immediate aftermath, to um, where do drone strikes fit in human rights law and international humanitarian law. Um and then later, uh, a related piece on uh, discourse analysis that I co-wrote with uh, a scholar um, based uh, at, at Leeds University, or University of Leeds, I may have gotten that wrong, uh, Jack Holland, uh, on national security speeches that were used to, to, just, to excuse me, justify drone strikes. And you know, what's always sort of present in um, the work that I'm doing is uh, you know, the, the role the United States plays um, in the world. And so... Um, you know, my first book uh, that preceded the edited volume is titled uh, The United States and Genocide, Redefining the Relationship. And it uses the, um, you know, the Bosnia versus Serbia case. Uh, and for those who, um, you know, maybe aren't familiar, uh, the International Court of Justice deals with, uh, you know, disputes between states in the world. And uh, Bosnia brought a case against Serbia uh, for its alleged role in the genocide at Srebrenica in 1995. And uh, what the International Court of Justice did was set a number of precedents about what constitutes failure to prevent genocide, what obligation states have, uh, what is complicity in genocide, what does it mean to conspire to commit genocide, and so on. Uh, and I use that framework to look at the U.S. relationships with uh, Indonesia during the 65-66 massacres. I mean, I would call it genocide, but uh, political groups are not included in the genocide convention. So 
technically legally, um, you know, doesn't sort of fall there. Um, but also the U.S. relationship with Pakistan in 1971, uh, when you know I would argue genocide was committed in East Pakistan, present-day Bangladesh, uh, with Rio Sma in Guatemala, with Saddam Hussein during the Kurdish genocide in Iraq, and just to kind of show that you know basically my argument is that Samantha Power, who wrote you know what will probably be the best-selling genocide studies book um, in of all time for all time. Um, what I argue is sort of, you know, criticized U.S. foreign policy around the sort of acceptable margins, but didn't go far enough in terms of uh, how, she, you know, she approached uh, the U.S. relationship. And uh, so, yeah, so that was that. Uh, and, you know, obviously the, the the connection is with the, you know, again, U.S. human, U.S. and human rights uh, with the drone strikes. And so that tends to be a underlying theme in a lot of the research. So let's turn to this book and I'll ask a, the, the basic obvious question first. Uh, the book is titled Cultural Genocide. Um, how do you define cultural genocide? So in the book, I, I didn't want to, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll back up one sec. Um, there's different forms that we talk about, right? So the book is divided into two sections, one on sort of forced assimilation, colonial settler, um, and, and so on. And then uh, the second part is on uh, more focused on um, tangible cultural destruction. So the destruction of artifacts, uh, monuments, um, you know, essentially like, UNE- I'm sorry, I was going to say UNESCO, but cultural heritage that has been recognized as a uh, fundamental, um, you know, to the sort of world culture. And um, so the definition I used in the book um, was an attempt not to impose any one definition. And so I borrowed from Damien Short, uh, who has a book called Redefining Genocide, which is actually a book I would I would recommend. Um, and it was defined as, quote, a method of genocide which destroys a social group through the destruction of their culture. Um, and so this, I thought, would leave it kind of open-ended for scholars to approach the topic of cultural genocide without feeling like they have to fit it into a, a box. So why this book now? Um, so this is also interesting. Um, you know, because of my dissertation research, uh, one thing I did notice, uh, well, first of all, is the language in the genocide convention does change. And so, um, you know, we, we can certainly talk about uh, Raphael Lemkin, if you'd like. Um, but in the early draft of the genocide convention, the secretariat draft, it had uh, and pretty exhaustive definition of cultural genocide. And cultural genocide was also included along physical genocide and biological genocide in the same article. So essentially cultural genocide was you know, placed as an equal, even if it's a different degree or different form, is placed equally as- alongside uh, the other methods. And then in the ad hoc committee draft, which came you know a little later uh, and it was being negotiated by uh, seven states and on... Um, cultural genocide was kind of pared down um, quite a bit. And then it ultimately was separated from physical and biological genocide uh, at the behest of the United States. Um, And essentially the reasoning was uh, that if it's separated, the United States and other states that oppose cultural genocide could submit a reservation. So they could basically say, we recognize physical and biological genocide as methods of genocide in Article 2, but we don't recognize cultural genocide. And then um, ultimately, though, cultural genocide was removed from the adopted text, uh, the text that was adopted in December of 1948. Uh, the United States was one of the more aggressive states in opposition, uh, essentially threatening to undermine the uh, viability of the treaty uh, through its influence over other states. Um, and so cultural genocide was removed. There's also part of a compromise. You know, the Soviet Union didn't want political groups protected. And so ultimately, political groups were removed, cultural genocide was removed. And so, you know, that was part of my, um, you know, reason for ultimately uh, editing this volume. Um, but there also an interesting exchange I had with a, a colleague um, who I, I was presenting at a conference. Uh, this was probably way back in 2013 or so. Um, and before I even got out of, I got out of my mouth, my p- perception of cultural genocide or my position, um, it was kind of scoffed at that, that this idea that cultural genocide could be genocide. Um, and so that was, you know, I, I it, it was a sort of informative, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> informative exchange. And, um, and, you know, the other thing was there was so little literature at the time on cultural genocide. And, 
I had actually complained to uh, my partner now wife uh, Jeannie about this, and she's like, "Well, why don't you add to the literature?" Then it's like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah, like as, what a great idea!" Um, and so, you know, I had worked with Adam Jones, who's the editor of the series for Rutledge on uh, genocide and crimes against humanity. And uh, so, once I had the book on U.S. and U.S. and genocide, it's like, well, maybe I should talk to Adam about you know the possibility of doing this edited volume. And you know, so I developed this proposal and got a great group of contributors together, and uh, ultimately it was contracted. And um, yeah, I'm very happy about it. It's um, at the time I counted it being as only the third book that focuses entirely on cultural genocide, and it was the first edited volume that's bringing all these diverse cases and perspectives together. And so, yeah. So for those of you listeners who are new to the podcast, uh, Adam's been on at least a couple times, maybe more than that. Um, and he's always insightful and interesting. And so I encourage you to go back and listen to those. Uh, in particular, he and John Cox were on to talk about the process of writing textbooks about genocide, which I thought was a really interesting interview. Um, so so I want to get back to this this comment you mentioned uh, by the per- colleague at the uh, conference. But, but before we do that, uh, maybe just a little attention to historical case studies. And, and, and you write about the um, uh, situation or the case of indig- indigenous people in the United States. And, and for listeners who are unfamiliar with that, can you say just a little bit about the way, the kinds of treatment that were imposed or the, the kinds of behaviors and actions that were imposed on indigenous people in the United States and why you think that amounts to cultural genocide? Sure. So, um, and this, you know, will give also a little bit of insight into why the United States maybe didn't want cultural genocide included in the genocide convention. And I can give uh, the reasons that they gave for why they wanted it omitted. But if we put it in this historical context that you just asked about, um, it's certainly maybe give some ideas of why, how there may have been some incentives for making sure it was removed. And so, you know, this was part of a sort of shift in terms of U.S. policy towards uh, the indigenous communities in, in the United States. And um, I mean, to there's a famous quote that some listeners may be familiar with uh, that maybe summarizes it, and then I can go into um, some of the specifics. And it's, quote, kill the Indian to save the man, uh, or kill the Indian, save the man, end quote. Um, and the idea was, you know, essentially to anglicize um, indigenous youth. And part of this was there's a, there was an idea that the um, older generations of indigenous peoples were uh, too set in their quote unquote heathen ways. Um, and so therefore, there was this idea of uh, targeting the youth. And one of the main um, pathways to targeting the youth was through education. And that's where you know the reg- residential schools um, came into play. And you know, so students were, um, or you know, youth were removed from their families, um, put into these schools. Um, names were they were given Anglo names, uh, haircuts. Um, you know, educated in uh, oftentimes uh, Christianity, uh, and then the practices, uh, customs, traditions, the use of the language was prohibited. And in some cases, there was uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for here. Um, it's escaping me, but essentially extreme forms of punishment, including uh, physical punishment for, um, you know, violating these prohibitions. And so, um, yeah, uh, you, there was, it's interesting because at the same time that they were being anglicized, um, I don't think there was ever really an understanding that even if they succeeded in anglicizing uh, these youth, that they would ever um, be treated uh, with the same uh, dignity and respect of of white children, um, and so um, yeah, this was basically their attempt to quote unquote civilize um, indigenous peoples in the United States, um, but not necessarily with the purpose of um, bringing them up to you know what they would say the same level as um, as the white children, or, or and, and then therefore white adults. And I want to—I I should have said this initially. I want to point out that 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 chapter in the book was was co-authored. And I'm mm-hmm. sorry, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Lauren Karasik, is that correct? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so wanna... you know, something I was just going to um, yeah. to add. Yeah. So if we think about um, 
why the United States uh, wanted cultural genocide removed, we can also look at the other colonial powers because the United Kingdom and France were also opposed to the inclusion. Uh, and they had, uh, of course, colonies in all over uh, the world, but um, Africa in particular. And you know, one of the things that I don't know if I argue in this book, um, but I have elsewhere, is that they didn't need to be sure that they were committing cultural genocide or not committing it. Um, just the possibility that they could be implicated in the commission of genocide would be incentive uh, in, enough. Um, and what they did and during the uh, negotiations is seek to essentially trivialize um, things that constituted cultural genocide. Um, so they equated cultural genocide to burning books. And burning books uh, or destroying books was a um, an element of cultural genocide. Um, but, you know, they were basically arguing this is a minority rights issue. Um, so this should be in a human rights convention. Uh, we should not be equating something... Um, uh, you know, like uh, the physical destruction of a group with burning books, which, you know, I certainly think um, understates the uh, impacts of cultural um, genocide or acts that would have constituted cultural genocide had they been included. So you have a variety of other case studies. Um, and, and I should say many of these case studies focus or serve both to illustrate the case study, but also to make a broader point about cultural genocide. And so I wonder without asking you to go through each of those case studies, uh, which is unfair and impossible given the time <laughs> constraints, um, I wonder what broad themes emerge from those case studies. As an editor, as you're reading all of these essays together for the first or second or probably 15th time, <laughs> what, what do you see coming out of these collectively that you might not notice or, or, or maybe that are emphasized collectively that are not as important when you look at one case study at a time. Sure. So, you know, in case after case, I, I mean, I should, you know, maybe give a, a brief overview of, of cases. So, um, you know, the, the first part of the, the book deals with, with international law. And so, uh, you know, Doug Irvin Erickson has a piece on, on Raphael Lemkin and, um, how we should understand Wemkin's own um, position on um, cultural genocide, or you know, and the destruction of of, of a nation. Um, you know, then I, I have a piece that uh, you know I've already given a little bit of um, insights into on how cultural genocide ended up being excluded from the convention. And then David Nersessian has a, a book on, I'm sorry, a chapter on more recent developments that sort of set case law precedent and other things around um, elements of what. I, you know, we call cultural genocide. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, there's a chapter on, on Australia that, uh, Martin Short, um, so not Martin Short, Martin Short is an actor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. Now I'm totally, um, Damien Short, excuse me, and Martin Crook, um, on, on Australia and, uh, you know, ecocide as it contributes to uh, and capitalism and how it creates uh, these extractive industries and its impact on indigenous peoples. Um, uh, Jenna Nasace has a chapter on an indigenous group in Brazil and how agribusiness there is affecting uh, indigenous ways of life and, and ways of being. And uh, Shell Anderson has uh, one on, on West Papua and, um, you know, uh, what he describes as cold genocide or slow motion genocide there. Uh, and then it does turn to to cultural destruction. And uh, Helen Mal uh, Malko has a chapter on uh, Iraq and the uh, so-called Islamic State and its destruction of cultural heritage. Uh, Mujan Momin has one on the Baha'i and, and Iran. And uh, Dawud Abdullah has one on on Palestine. And then, um, and this is a, a little bit separate, me, you know, happy to come back to it, but Andrew Wolford has a great chapter on on transitional justice. And I give you all that background just to um, kind of get to that, you know, in case after case, uh, you know, the persecution of particular groups and attacks on their shared cultural identity and the heritage had and continue to have consequences for um, affected peoples that extend well beyond uh, the immediate harm. Uh, cultural genocide affects group cohesion. Uh, it affects identity, memory, and, and way of life. Uh, and the cases in the book illustrate the ways uh, such Ill, Ill treatment and attacks uh, that threaten the very existence of group as such. And I think as such is really uh, a key part of this because, um, you know, when we talk about physical destruction, we're talking about attempts to uh, 
um, destroy the group by killing off the group, essentially. Uh, and that can happen through immediate physical violence. I mean, if you think about biological, that can also um, be sort of like a cutting off point, right? So if you are um, forcibly marrying members of one group into another, and then the children that they produce are in that group, uh, it may take longer than direct physical violence, but ultimately, when coupled with physical violence, you can imagine how um, a group's existence, even if not 100% being wiped out, um, could be uh, destroyed um, to the point where um, you know the, the group barely exists as as a group. Um, but uh, you know, as such, I think is an important part for the cultural genocide aspect because um, you know we're not necessarily talking about although cultural genocide can certainly be accompanied by other forms of uh, attempts at destroying the group. Um, if you destroy the group's identity, if you dis- erase the group's uh, previous existence, and if you discontinue the group's ability to produce its unique um, cultural um, heritage, uh, then you are destroying the group uh, as such by taking away you know their unique identity. And so, uh, you know, the persecution of groups and attacks on their cultural heritage have often been part and parcel to a broader, uh, what I would say, you know, Wemkin puts as a synchronized attack on different aspects of life. Um, and that's a, you know, I think then therefore cultural genocide and the study of it sort of returns us to uh, a more holistic understanding of genocide rather than focusing, focusing excuse me, focusing solely on uh, genocide as being a, the, you know, the end goal, the end result being um, the eraser of the group physically from the earth. So most certainly uh, the the the, the um, cultural genocide, the genocides of in 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 the U.S. or North America more broadly, uh, and Australia encompass a period of time before the mid eighteen hundreds. But but broadly, all of these case studies are modern case studies. Um, what do you? And I wonder if that's on purpose. If that's because of a a perspective on cultural genocide that mostly limits cultural genocide to the modern period, or whether that's a matter of convenience. You could find authors who could talk about that who are willing to write. And and then more broadly, what what do you imagine including earlier case studies might do to the broader perspective on cultural genocide? Sure. Um, so the main reason why the the cases that were uh, chosen um, have a particular temporal you know, sort of bracket um, is the the focus was on cases that I mean some you know certainly preceded the genocide convention, um, but they continued on after. And so um, the idea was uh, was a more modern history because um, you know we're working on um, current or modern international law, um, and so. Uh, you know, the indigenous cases that are in the book and that you mentioned um, certainly extend beyond uh, 1948. Uh, and then many of the cases then, uh, of course, are, are even more recent in, in history. So um, that was really the, the main um, focus there. Um, you know, I'm not a historian, so I, uh, I don't want to speak in ways, you know, on things I'm not overly familiar with. But uh, I certainly think if you could, you know, back up from there. Um, to the age of exploration, um, and look at, um, you know, some of the, the earlier, um, times when, uh, Europeans, um, you know, sailed to uh, other parts of the world, including, um, the Americas. Um, and then if you go even further back again, I don't want to speak on things I don't know. Um, but I would imagine, um, that there were, uh, destruction of, of cultures through, um, Though associated more with uh, the physical violence um, uh, that that came um, rather than uh, cultural genocide alone, uh, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I I think there's one of the things this book does so well is point out the gaps in the literature, and and one of the gaps that is implicit is this this concentration on on modernity and and the modern period, and and so. For enterprising graduate students who are out here hoping to use this as a shortcut to complete your general exam, your comprehensive exams more easily, um, there's a space for dissertations out there um, from periods before this. Um, so, so you um, let me let me come back to this 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 comment your colleague made. Um, 
And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way in which genocide studies as a field has tried to wrestle with this notion of cultural genocide. What are, what are some, why, why has it become increasingly interesting? That's not the right word, but why have genocide studies people increasingly focused on this now, as opposed to 30 years ago? What, what are some of the concerns genocide scholars have about the notion of cultural genocide? Um, and how have people responded to those concerns? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I guess maybe one place to start would be, um, you know, the early genocide studies is, is, is predominantly sort of known for, um, Holocaust studies, which then evolved into, um, genocide studies, uh, and then particularly into comparative, uh, genocide studies. So, you know, I'm, Thinking about there was there wasn't a lot of, of focus on genocide studies for some period after the Holocaust, um, but then it, you know as it emerged, uh, focusing on on Nazism. Um, I mean, certainly we can look at Wemkin's uh, Axis uh, Powers in Occupied Europe, but um, in, in the early eighties, uh, there was this rise of, of comparative genocide studies, and um, you know I don't I don't think it was probably until the last fifteen years or so. Um, that we really saw a, a movement towards um, focusing on, on cultural genocide. And I think part of this has come in uh, greater attention being paid to um, indigenous peoples. Um, you know, we have the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that uh, was uh, in the 2000s. And, um, but in the scholarly literature, there's been a uh, I guess maybe a, I don't know, maybe a reluctance um, to recognize cultural genocide. And that's, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, part of this, I think uh, Ben Michies um, has a, has a book that talks about the hegemonic understanding of genocide uh, and genocide being synonymous with, uh, with mass killing. Um, some would point to, um, you know, uh, Alex Hinton has the genocide studies canon and the prototype being the Holocaust. And if it doesn't look like the Holocaust, then, um, you know, it, it maybe it's not treated uh, the same way within genocide studies, um, which is, I, you know, I think kind of interesting because uh, there were certainly uh, elements of cultural genocide, um, you know, present in, in during the Holocaust. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just the, uh, and I don't mean just to trivialize, but it wasn't the the mass killings um, were not the only forms of genocide that occurred there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I did a little bit of, of research for the introduction for the book, and I, I looked at, there is a, a survey of genocide uh, studies, alternative definitions of genocide. And uh, Scott Strauss uh, published an article on this, and Adam Jones includes this in his book, um, Genocide, a Comprehensive Introduction. And, you know, it was massively, uh, the definitions uh, include um, mass killing, um, and typically a substantial um, number of people, uh, of members of the group. Um, you know, biological genocide was included in a number of the definitions as well. Um, but there were very few that included, uh, included cultural genocide. And so, um, you know, the evolution, I think in terms of the recognition, uh, well, I guess I should take one step back. Um, and I'm trying to start to lose my train of thought, but, uh, you know, cultural genocide is something that, um, a lot of scholars, I think, would say is not genocide itself unless it's accompanied by a physical attacks on members of the group. And even in some of the uh, international criminal jurisprudence, there was, um, you know, cultural genocide is not genocide, but it could be evidence of the intent to commit genocide. And so if we think about, you know, the, the records of the plans of, of the Nazi party, um, it was very clear what their intentions were. Um, but states don't always announce that they are intending to destroy a group. And so, um, you know, the, the, basically, uh, wall says, or the precedent was that, um, if physical killing is happening and they're also destroying the culture and prohibiting cultural, um, uh, practices and so on, then we can infer that they are intending to commit genocide by, um, those two things happening simultaneously, um, and so I do think, uh, you know, that, 
this renewed focus on uh, on the rights of indigenous peoples is why we're seeing uh, a resurgence of, of focus on cultural genocide and um, ideas about what cultural genocide is and that it is, in fact, um, genocide, uh, you know, whether or not it's accompanied by um, other acts. And, uh, you know, one thing I'll just uh, quickly note is, uh, you know, something I also talk about at the introduction is, you know, I don't know how many times I've said cultural <laughs> genocide on the podcast, <laughs> but does putting cultural in front of the term genocide uh, reinforce the idea that it's not genocide um, because we don't talk about physical genocide. We say genocide or biological, but every time I say cultural genocide, am I contributing to sort of a hierarchy of um, genocidal acts? And uh, it's it's a, you know, I'm not the first one to wrestle with this, um, but at the same time, it almost seems necessary to have the qualifier in front so that we know what we're talking about. And, um, and so, yeah, there's a, I, I don't know if it's counterproductive or not, but yeah. I was going to say longtime listeners who listen to other channels recognize that I sometimes pinch hit on new books and sports and I have an interest in women's sports history. And, um, and I was just looking at my channel guide yesterday and looking at a listing for college basketball and flipping to find out whether it was men's or women's basketball before recognizing that it is standard simply to identify basketball as men's basketball and then to attach women's to it if you have to, if, if in order to communicate to people that it's women playing and it's the same kind of, same kind of issue. Um, I did not know that there was a podcast channel on that. <laughs> uh, New Book and Sports, yes. It's uh, when, I, when, when I've read too much about death and destruction, I can go and do something that's at least occasionally more hopeful. Um, so you raise a cup, you point out a couple of, of, of objections that genocide scholars sometimes raise in the book. And one of them is that it's hard enough to get the international community to care about physical genocide that involves mass, mass killings. And, and given that while cultural genocide is tragic, we should focus our attention on physical genocides and trying to elevate cultural genocide risks, diluting our effort and attention. I wonder how you would respond to that. So, I mean, I understand the perspective, but, um, and, and I agree that it is hard enough to get um, attention paid to, um, you know, to to physical genocide and, you know, the immediate threat um, to physical integrity that is involved. Um, but I don't think that's a, I mean, in my opinion, it's uh, the sentiment I think is valid, but um, the idea that there are, should be a, essentially a hierarchy of suffering um is something that I do find uh, uh, problematic. Um, you know, if we think about, um, you know, putting it maybe in the context of direct physical violence versus structural violence, um, you know, the idea that this is most important because, you know, people are dying and, and that, of course, is, is significant, um, but that people should just sort of wait because their long-term suffering um, is something that, you uh, that does not involve necessarily this immediate threat to physical integrity is to essentially tell them that, you know, you have to wait until we deal with this before, you know, we focus on your suffering. Um, and I think that in some ways normalizes that this you have to tolerate, but this is unacceptable. Um, you know, meaning, you know, uh, physical direct physical violence is unacceptable, but we have to tolerate other forms of, of suffering. Um, and I think, you know, we can accept or acknowledge that there are different degrees of, um, of, of, of violence committed in genocide, but, um, that does not mean one has to be elevated above another, if, if that makes sense. Um, and then a second, not, not equivalent critique, but, but, but a challenge from the other direction to this notion of cultural genocide, I think is, it comes from Andrew Wolford, who, who also has been on the program before. And in his chapter in your book, he argues that, Many people who talk about cultural genocide have adopted a westernized understanding of cultural genocide that divorces things like language and literary traditions and forms of dress from, from it divorces that from ways that some groups, often indigenous groups, 
have relationships to land and to territory that are intrinsic in their understanding of themselves as groups. And so limiting or the, so the way that we now talk about cultural genocide um, leads to notions of redress and justice that ignore the idea that for indigenous peoples to not have a relation, the traditional relationship to their land means that they are not the same people. So, so I wonder, um, I don't know how recently you've read his chapter, um, <laughs> but, but what do you, how does Wolford's notion that we need to expand the, the idea of cultural genocide to include physical and geographic and economic elements? Um, what, what did you think of that when you, when you looked at that chapter? Sure. Thank you. Um, if, if I, if you don't mind, I, I, can I add one more thing to the previous yeah, and then I'll ahead. get to yep. that? Yeah. So, so, uh, cause one thing I did want to, to mention about, um, you know, this sort of physical genocide versus cultural genocide and, um, you know, th- you know, the direct violence versus longer term, um, destruction or what I would argue is destruction is, um, you know, there's, uh, it has transitional justice or justice, uh, impacts as well as restoration. Um, and so, you know, one of the, you know, going back to the argument I made about the U S you know, that the U S made against cultural genocide, that burning books and mass killings are uh, on completely different levels. Um, as you notice challenging enough for restoration and repair, uh, let alone prevention, um, but also, you know, restoration and repair in the aftermath of violence on a massive scale. Um, but you know, this again does make it more challenging for acts of cultural genocide to be recognized, to be acknowledged, uh, you know, to be placed rightfully in our historical memory, uh, restoration and repair of what was impacted or destroyed, um, with restoration and repair in some cases, you know, being impossible, um, something that is irreplaceable if it's destroyed is gone forever. Um, and you know, uh, this, uh, examples of, um, you know, the lack of, um, justice for, uh, you know, these historical acts, uh, that, you know, that I describe as cultural genocide. Um, and in, in the American context, uh, you know, president Obama in 2009, um, actually recognized, uh, you know, and apologized for the treatment of, of native Americans. Um, but it also foreclosed, uh, legal recourse, um, for individuals and ancestors, um, if we also could, we could look at the Truth Commission for Canada and how it used cultural genocide in quotes. It said we did all of these things, but you know, there's no legal um, grounding because cultural genocide was removed from, from uh, the Genocide Convention. And so, you know, it's in some ways it's hard to get cultural genocide recognized, but in some ways it's also potentially easier than getting genocide recognized because of the lack of uh, of legal recourse associated. Um, and I think this does connect to, you know, to Andrew's, uh, contribution. Um, you know, Andrew raises important questions about, uh, what actually constitutes justice for indigenous peoples. And, you know, I'll get to the, um, the other thing about, you know, the, on cultural genocide, but, um, you know, when we discuss transitional justice, uh, as Andrew argues, then we often do so in terms of our societies and our understandings, uh, such as retributive justice, um, even when we talk about restorative and reparative justice, oftentimes it's defined, you know, how we define uh, and what survivors and victims should get um, in terms of restoration and repair. And so um, you asked, uh, you know, how recently I, I, I read Andrew's chapter and I, I gave it a look, um, you know, you know, leading up to our interview here. And, um, you know, if you don't mind, I, I, I would share an excerpt from it. Uh, so Andrew writes, Quote, without taking away what compensation and symbolic address, uh, I'm sorry, redress might mean to an individual survivor of Canada's Indian residential school system, uh, which is where, you know, how Andrew situated his chapter, uh, these redress measures do not move beyond symbolic forms. Even the compensation is largely symbolic since it obviously cannot ameliorate the levels of harm experienced by survivors. More to the point of this chapter, though, the measures also fail to grapple with the ontological destruction perpetrated by Canadian settler colonialism. The key sources of indigenous collective becoming, namely territory, language, kin, other than human relations, and story, the very things that were targeted through the compulsory transfer of indiv- indigenous children to assimilative schools, are barely registered in the Indian, Indian residential school settlement agreement. Uh, Andrew also writes in, in the conclusion of his chapter, Quote, cultural genocide is rarely ever sing- singularly cultural. 
when the cultural techniques of destruction, such as forced assimilation through residential schools, sever relationships between indigenous children and their families, territories, language, and other than human relations, they also strike at the very material existence of the group. This is an ontological destruction that targets the complex intersections of nature and culture that make possible ongoing processes of group becoming. To name this as cultural genocide and then to seek to repair it through restorative justice or reconciliation is to miss this larger point. In fact, the naming threatens a form of epistemological violence as it imposes a way of seeing the world as well as a pathway to redress that fails to listen to what indigenous scholars and leaders are telling us. Um, and I think, you know, that's a uh, really, really powerful, um, you know, s- you know, state uh, statement, I guess, yeah, that, that Andrew is, is putting forth there. Um, because as you mentioned, it, it, it situates cultural genocide as something that's not just cultural. It's not just um, sort of, prohibiting or impeding the process of cultural uh, reproduction, but it actually has direct physical and material impacts on, on the people whose cultures have been uh, threatened through these, these various practices. And then on top of that, even when we start talking about what justice means or what justice ought to look like for, say, uh, indigenous peoples who are seeking justice and redress, that if we start putting justice in in our terms, and maybe there's some sort of financial thing, uh, or maybe there's uh, some limited portion of land, or or maybe they get to, uh, they have fishing rights that, um, you know, that large scale fishers uh, don't have. Um, it's not really necessarily addressing um, the larger issues um, that need to be a- addressed. and. Um, and so then it's almost like adding on to the indignities that have already been suffered by looking at justice uh, through our lens rather than their own. So we're, we've, we've talked for quite a while. Um, I guess I'd ask a couple, I don't know if practical is the right word, but kind of concluding questions. And, and one is, um, one, I guess I'll circle back to what you, your, your very first answer about how you became interested in genocide studies and and it's an answer I've got from a lot of people when I ask this question. And it's in fact, my own, I was a little older than you. I was in graduate school during the Rwandan and Bosnian genocide, but that's what particularly uh, made me aware of the field and made me passionate about pursuing it. Um, so if you, having worked on this project, if you were talking to policymakers or people trying to influence policy, what takeaways come out of this book? What would you want them to hear? Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is it's not going to be profound, um, but <laughs> it's uh, you know because it's 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 out there already. Um, but I think um, you know a number of things. Uh, if we just take the you know the United States context, um, and there's been uh, I forget what the the name of there was some recent uh, conference that I think was on a sort of truth commission, um, mm. but it, but it didn't involve policymakers or, um, elected officials. I think it was mm. largely activists, advocates, and, and academics. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, it's, we're beyond the point where, uh, the United States, um, should have some form of, uh, truth and reconciliation. Uh, and this is for, um, both, uh, indigenous peoples, but also African Americans. Mm. Uh, and, and, I mean, I, I really, I think it should encompass um, as much as possible uh, as many historical, um, what I would say, are crimes uh, uh, as possible. Because um, you know, I, I'm actually working on a, a paper right now, and I know that uh, I assume that you end with a question like this. Uh, yes, so I, I hate to, to jump the shark, but uh, and I don't think <laughs> that's the right way to use that. Um, but uh, you know, I think to move forward, we add we can't we have to address things that have happened in the past. And um, otherwise, you know, as some would say we're destined to repeat these things, but it's not, for me, it's not even repeating. It's that we're, we're continuing them um, rather than p- repeating them. I think we need to tie um, things that are happening today to, um, you know, to our history. And so I think um, we need acknowledgement, we need um, reparations um, and any, and, but at the same time, as I mentioned with Andrew's chapter, um, it has to be, um, through the uh, informed uh, consent of of the people, um, you know, and of whose pop, or sorry, whose communities 
have suffered. So I think that's the the biggest thing. And I don't think that has to be limited to the United States. I don't think the United States is alone in not with in a lack of willingness to acknowledge its history. Uh, I mean, we could look at Turkey and the Armenian genocide as, as an example. Um, but if we really are going to move forward, um, then I think we have to um, you know, acknowledge and, and, and document the past. So, you know, truth and reconciliation commissions, um, have an educational effect as well, um, because the proceedings are recorded and it's out there for everyone to see. And I think that, uh, you know, a, a simple apology is just insufficient, uh, when we're talking about the scale of, um, you know, the impacts of, of, you know, historical policies on, um, different communities. So, so a, a related question: If you're now now instead of talking to policymakers, you're talking to people who are in the genocide studies community. What what new kinds of questions or what gaps need should should they be thinking about? Where what what do you want this book to stimulate in terms of further research? Hmm. In terms of further research. Um... I, I may actually say something about this in the book. I should have refreshed myself. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, if I, if you don't mind me putting a slightly different spin on no, it, um, you know, I, I, thinking more of, you know, broadly for genocide studies, um, you know, Dirk Moses has a book that just mm-hmm. came out that I had the, you know, the uh, chance to interview him about called The Problems of Genocide, uh, Permanent Security and the Language of Transgression. And, um, you know, uh, there's, it's, it's a 500 or so page book. So there's so much more in it than I'm about to say, but, um, you know, Dirk does raise, um, some concerns about the international criminal hierarchy. And, um, and I mentioned, you know, hierarchy of human suffering earlier in, in, in our discussion. Um, and I think it's really important for genocide studies to, um, continue because I think it's happening, but to continue to move out of a sort of silo um, that I think it has had operated in for a, a long time um, to look at other forms of violence and suffering. And, you know, it's, we could think about, well, it's not, it, something's not genocide, but that doesn't mean um, that the human suffering involved um, should be completely removed from our genocide studies lens. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, Dirk raises a question. Uh, he says something like, um, for victims of genocide and, and you know, quote unquote, collateral damage, um, you know, what really um, is, is the difference in terms of, um, you know, the suffering, um, especially if they're, you know, if, if they're both innocent. Uh, and I really messed up that quote. I apologize, Dirk, if you listen to this. Um, but I, I think that's important. And, I, you know, one of the things I'm looking at um, or will be looking at, hopefully, is um, what I would argue is a nexus between aggressive war and genocide, uh, including, uh, I'm, you know, in a comparison of genocide propaganda and uh, and war propaganda, um, you know, to see if there are comparisons that can be made between the dehumanization of, of the people who, um, you know, are ultimately uh, killed or affected in other ways. Um, and so... Yeah, you know, there's. I, I wrote a piece called uh, "The Four Four Schools of Thought on the Relationship Between War and Genocide," mm-hmm. um, and you know, I, I did find uh, this really um, adamant uh, position among some genocide scholars that war crimes are war crimes and genocide is genocide. When we compare the two, um, mm-hmm. we're doing a disservice to the victims of genocide, and and I. I just I don't think that's necessarily the case, uh, especially when we think about what the intentions are in aggressive war, um, and then look at you know and how that can be compared to the intent in genocide. So, mm-hmm. so I I'll, I'll circle back then to the story I told at the beginning. Is there a danger <laughs> of pushing this notion of cultural violence or cultural genocide too far? Is it? Is it legitimate to claim that because people are buying second houses in your village that this is a form of cultural genocide? Yeah, so I, uh, I, I was an interest, I did not know that about that story. And it's not and fair. You, you haven't read the story, so. <laughs> but I, I think it's an interesting question, and uh, I'm going to sort of maybe cop out a little on the answer by going to to Lemkin, um, and you know, Lemkin talked about uh, different phases of genocide, and um, you know. One being uh, the forced removal of a group and then imposing, you know, the political and social and, you know, legal and whatever, all the institutions um, on that land. So now you've basically erased the existence from uh, a particular area. Um, And then there's also 
um, the uh, you, know, you know leaving allowing people to stay, but also imposing um, the institutions of the group uh, that is now occupying that land. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'd have a hard time um, calling what you, you know, what you describe from this art article as cultural genocide. Um, but it does raise, I think, important issues around human rights. Uh, if we look at gentrification, um, you know, say in the, in the United States context, um, I do think that if from these transatlantic, transatlantic uh, slave trade, um, all the way up to today, that there have been efforts, including um, uh, you know some that are documented in uh, the uh, pamphlet slash book "We Charge Genocide," um, that extend beyond um, you know say gentrification. Um, that you know you could raise you know questions about cultural genocide uh, in the United States. But what you're describing from the article, um, I'm not sure if I could say without you know more. Sure, and I'm and I should say I'm less interested in the article itself as in wondering where the outer bounds of this definition are about this this discussion about what is and is not cultural genocide. Um, I think the field has quite appropriately pushed those definitional boundaries outward, mm-hmm. but I wonder where where that process ends. Presumably, there is an end somewhere, and I'm not sure where that is, and that may be something that that that. This, this, as this discussion continues, that comes up. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think a you know case by case basis also helps, yeah. so you can look at the you know the particular features. Um, mm. of each. Uh, just out of curiosity, I know we're getting long. Yeah. Wh- where was this article published? Because I'm I I'm surprised if was this a mainstream media publication? That was the New York Times yesterday. So really, yeah, that's interesting. So, um, and I have to confess, it was late at night, and I been pretending to grade papers, so I may not have read it as cogently as I would have liked, but um, but we are a little long, and so I want to say thank you so much for joining us, um, and you've answered already at least a little bit one of my concluding questions, and so I will give my usual answer, which is that when you finish these projects, I'd love to have you come back and talk to us again, um, but, but you haven't yet answered the first one with, of my concluding questions, and so I'll offer you this opportunity. Thanksgiving is coming, and I'm sure my students will be pretending to do homework and I'll be pretending to grade. Um, and so what should I be reading? What, what, what would you suggest that I read or the audience reads or watches or listens to that, that's important, that has been important to you as you've thought about this subject? Sure. Um, you know, I mentioned, uh, in the interview that I, uh, use a, a definition of cultural genocide from Damien Short. Uh, I highly recommend, uh, his book, Redefining Genocide, Settler Colonialism, Social Death, and Ecocide. Um, really interesting book. And, you know, this idea of social death builds off of, uh, you know, Claudia Card. Um, you know, I know our, all, the list, all our listeners will not be able to access journal articles, but if you do have access, uh, Claudia Card has a great article on social death and genocide. Um, but for those who are interested in learning more uh, about you know treatment of indigenous peoples in the United States um, and from uh, an indigenous um, uh, writer's perspective, um, I highly recommend Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's "An Indigenous People's History of the United States." Um, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll plug one more thing from my end, um, or maybe two. Uh, I have a book coming out next year um, with Rutgers University Press. Uh, for its genocide um, series called uh, The Politics of Genocide, uh, From the Genocide Convention to the Responsibility to Protect. And uh, the one other thing I'll just note is I have a, I'm working on an edited volume now. I mentioned my interest in, um, you know, acknowledging the past to move forward. Uh, that will be part of a edited volume uh, that's also contracted with Rutgers called Genocide, The Path Ahead, um, which takes, a, you know, what I hope is a forward looking uh, rather than, you know, always looking backwards. Um, scholars are looking at questions about, um, you know, what does, you know, threat of genocide look like in the next 10 to 20 years? Um, how does the concept of genocide maybe need to evolve um, based on, uh, you know, emerging threats to uh, groups today? Well, those, those all sound like fascinating books and fascinating projects of yours. And as I said, um, I hope you'll join us again to talk about them uh, as, as they come out. And But until then, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for 
joining us today. Um, for those listeners, we were talking to Jeffrey Bachman about his new book or his uh, recent book, Cultural Genocide, Law, Politics, and Global Man- Manifestations, published by Routledge. Uh, and so thanks, Jeff, and um, have a great semester. Thank you, Kelly. You too. 